Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Acts, and I'm reading from the 34th verse. Listen now to the word of God. Then Peter began to speak, saying, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. But God accepts men and women from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. May God add to our understanding of that reading from God's word. Amen. Just a little background first. The passage we just read comes right on the heels of the story where Peter is praying one day at dinner time. He sees a vision of a large sheet filled with all kinds of non-kosher animals. And a heavenly voice says to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter, being an observant Jew, refuses and the voice replies, What God has made clean, you must not consider sacrilegious. While Peter is trying to figure out what the vision meant, he is commanded by God to go to the home of a Roman centurion named Cornelius, which in itself was not kosher. But Peter obeyed God and went on this questionable mission without a clue what was about to happen. Have you ever played catchphrase? Anybody? (laughs) Well, it's kind of like charades where a timer is set, and I have to get people to guess the phrase I'm giving with my words and my actions But you have to know that this is not an amiable, Donna Reed, lounging in the living room kind of game. It's an extreme game. It's a get on the edge of your seat game. It's a game that requires USDA grade A ham and imagination like a steel trap and the concentration of the buyers and sellers on the floor of the stock exchange. This game is played against the clock, where the victory belongs to the swift and the clever. And if you've ever played a game like that, you know how it feels, don't you? Your mind races as fast as the blood rushing in your veins. Images and ideas are passing before you like a subway train. And then one of them will stand out like a spark You'll get this flash of insight, and you have to go with it. So you catch your breath, you cross your fingers, and you leap onto the stage. You're out there without a net, but you play it out with everything you got. Well, I believe something like that is what Peter was experiencing at this moment. He found himself preaching to a house full of Romans. 
He must have been feeling like he was out on a limb, running full steam with this idea, this flash of insight that he'd only just received. And what's even more striking is that it was an idea that contradicted everything he had ever believed. It was an idea that contradicted everything he'd ever stood for and suffered for when it came to his faith. See, most of Peter's life, he had carried this burden as a Jew, being one of God's chosen people. And even now, as a Christian, he's in that same camp, that same situation. And standing in that situation, he'd suffered the insults of the Roman occupiers who thought his faith naive and presumptuous. They'd say things like, your God is the God of the universe? Get real. So standing in that company, he stood firmly on the ground of his traditions and scriptures that supported everything he said and did, down to the smallest detail. But now, in this story, all of a sudden, there he was, preaching the gospel to a group of folks who weren't kosher and telling them that God doesn't play favorites. God shows no partiality, he said. Jesus Christ is Lord of all people. And he was probably as surprised that he'd said that as they were to have heard it. See, Peter was working without a net because at the time he didn't have any scriptural or traditional precedent for this message. He didn't have a manuscript from Jesus containing a well-reasoned basis for this claim. And part of the reason that he didn't have any of that is because Jesus always presented the same defense to those who wanted to debate his teachings. Over and over, Jesus simply said, look at what I do, look at how I live my faith, and base your decision on that. And that is exactly what Peter proclaimed to that congregation at Cornelius' house. It suddenly occurred to Peter that Jesus himself is the message that had been sent to Israel. Jesus, Peter told the congregation the meaning of life and the promise of new life was based on everything that certain people had seen Jesus do and say from his cradle to the grave. And on this occasion, Peter suddenly was sparked with a flash of insight as he remembered the inclusive love towards all people that Jesus showed throughout his life on earth. And based on that, with his heart in his throat, Peter proclaimed Jesus is the saving, healing Lord for everyone on this earth. Now there are ways that his message is important for my own life as well. You know, there are so many ways that Jesus finds his way to each of us. This is one of the most amazing and comforting things about Jesus. He finds a way to reach the most resistant souls there are. And every one of us has our own story where we can say, Jesus found me, offering God's love and light and truth, and I was drawn somehow to receive that new life. And then we realize the good news that Jesus walks through every moment with me for the rest of my life until king, the kingdom comes. And still, once I decide to follow Jesus, trying to live my faith is difficult sometimes 
because I'm following someone who knows me so well and occasionally knows me too well. It's great to know that He loves and accepts me unconditionally, and I'm eternally grateful for His mercy and grace. But there's also the times that Jesus exposes the parts of me that are troubling. Sometimes it's tough to see what's in the mirror. It's unsettling when Jesus confronts my prejudices or my ill-considered beliefs or the things I've done or failed to do that show the parts of my life that still need work. Nevertheless, this story teaches me that I have to deal with whatever God reveals. God's revelation is always connected to some kind of response, some kind of task that God wants me to do, or some kind of next step of growth God wants me to take. It's always up to me whether or not I will respond to what God reveals. This passage also has something to say to us as his church. See, following Jesus is always going to be both a grand adventure of discovery and growth, but it's can also be unsettling when doing so confronts our world's values and purposes. This story tells us that there are times when you and I as followers of Jesus are going to be called to go for an extreme religion, to proclaim our faith without a net. This story tells me that the prerequisite for living that faith is to plunge myself into this ongoing journey of truly getting to know my God, truly getting to know God's heart and what it's truly like when it comes to how His creation is regarded. I am called as a member of His church to go out on a limb as I continually learn what I'm supposed to be and do in order to be a faithful follower of His. How do I do that? Well, I do it by looking at the life of Jesus. I do it by prayer and study and spiritual practices that inform and deepen my devotion. And then what's going to happen is what happened to Peter. You and I will experience this adventure of inspiration as we see the new ways that God is at work in the world, as we see the new things that God is doing all around us so that we can respond accordingly. And people of God, that will feel unsettling sometimes. But the promise is that God will help us through all the doubts and fears and crises of faith we may have every step of the way. See, there's a spontaneity to this kind of life. That day so long ago, Peter realized that there was a lot of prejudice that not only kept people apart, but kept people at odds with each other. He was dealing with Judeans and Romans and Greeks and Samaritans and Palestinians and more, each of which was building their own nationalistic wall. There were about a hundred religions, each trying to displace the others and mostly by overpowering their opponents. And Peter saw all the hatred and all the futility of it all and proclaimed a solution the good news of the God who came and lived among us, healing and doing good and destroying the oppression of evil. And all that to show the whole human race a new way to live under a totally new kind of Lord. 
So I'm called to go out and show the world what our faith teaches me, that we're all responsible for the good and the healing and the spiritual emancipation of all. We're all called to follow our Lord, who proclaims to the world that everyone belongs in the human race God created. We follow a Lord who's called each and every one of us to extend a hand to give someone else a boost towards heaven. We follow a Lord who's called us to speak the truth in love and to speak it against any power that stands against his gospel. This week I've been thinking about these days that you and I are living in. I was realizing that there's too many people being lured into joining groups like ISIL and other hate groups from recruiters on the internet. There's too many youth in our culture shooting their classmates in schools. There's too many suicides and riots and bomb threats and more. And when I read the stories about some of these people who have perpetrated these horrific acts, I can't help but wonder, what if a Christian in their periphery or who knows them personally, spontaneously took courage and reached out and helped them to make better sense of life and their lives, of what is and what isn't true? What if someone in their proximity showed them God's love and God's grace and how being in a Christian community can change their lives now and forever. What if every Christian did that at work and at school and in their neighborhood? In the next to last verse of this passage, Peter referred to Jesus being the one who judges the living and the dead. And some people think that's about condemnation. But the Greek word is talking about distinguishing between life and death, as in telling the difference between the two. We are living in a time when so many people don't know what leads to life or what leads to death and destruction. As Christ's church... We are called to join our Lord Jesus in making that choice so clear and evident. As Christ's church, we are called to live and proclaim the message of Jesus so that new life reaches this world in need. In Jesus' name, amen.